This podcast is sponsored by Rosita Group, a wholly owned QSO of Michigan State University Federal Credit Union, with a mission to help credit unions stay relevant and competitive through innovation. Rosita Group invests in technologies and services that improve how credit unions engage with the members and help members engage with their money. Rosita Group, building better for members together with our partners. From the Credit Union National Association, this is the CUNA News Podcast. Credit Union people, credit union ideas. Welcome back to the CUNA News Podcast. I'm Yi Kang Yang, Digital Media Design Specialist at CUNA. On this episode of the podcast, you'll be hearing a conversation with Ben Maxim, COO at Rosita Group. In this technology-heavy conversation, look forward to hearing topics ranging from fintechs adapting to an ever-changing technology landscape, personalized financial solutions, data analytics, and AI, and what Rosita Group has to offer in regards to these topics. Enjoy. Welcome back, Ben, to the Kino News Podcast. We're happy to have you back here. For the part of the audience that aren't familiar with Rosita Group, why don't you tell us a little bit about Rosita Group, who you are, and what you do? Absolutely. Thanks, Kang, for having me back. Uh, happy to be back. And yeah, Rosita Group is a credit union service organization wholly owned by Michigan State University Federal Credit Union. We were founded about two and a half years ago, kind of with the mission to bring financial technology to the credit union space and help amplify it. And you know, quite often when fintechs were looking for funding or getting funding, they went with VCs or larger tech companies and then sometimes or large banks. And then some of that technology left the credit union space and it became harder for us to access. So really our goal uh, is to build better for members uh, and really help bring, bring cool, innovative tech to the credit union space and help it stay here and scale here and really grow this portfolio or this you know industry rich in technology, focus on community institutions. We've also, you know, taken on a role of building some of our own tech that started sometimes at MSFCU, where we built it first, and now we're looking to commercialize it and also sell that technology uh, to other credit unions as well. Great. So technology is a big part of what you guys do. Uh, How are fintechs using technology to stay relevant and adapt to the ever-demanding digital world? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the the one thing fintechs are always credited with are, are really understanding, you know, one slice of the, the financial experience, and they do it very well. They understand the experience, they understand the problem. Uh, a lot of times, uh, institutions, and, and we did this at MSFCU, uh, found, oh, you know, well, we think we can do it, let's create something. But as we're creating it, we may not create, you know, best in class everything, you know, we may create something passable and serviceable. Um, but really, that fintech is able to create a really great uh, experience. You know, it's hard for credit unions to go hire a bunch of data scientists or a bunch of people who are good at machine learning or AI or crypto or, or name the thing that is the new technology. We're not going to be able to hire all that. We're not going to build the skill sets, you know, quick enough to really take advantage of it. So fintechs are doing a great job of leveraging that technology and exploring it in a much quicker way. They're able to be more nimble and try it and explore it. And then bring it to credit unions where we can then figure out how it works in the financial, in the financial sector, highly regulated sector, and how, how maybe some of the compliance things that don't exist elsewhere, you know, we can help navigate and, and bridge that, but they can really lean into the tech and then leverage our expertise with how to operationalize it and bring it into our industry. And tell me more about how they are creating personalized financial solutions. Absolutely. So, you know, the, the investments the whole financial industry has been doing for the past decade plus, really, really amplified in the last about five years. We've figured out how to better organize our data, focus on uh, data governance, really building out these sort of best solutions. We took what used to be, you know, a bunch of report writers and, you know, either turned them into analysts or we've hired people who are more specifically in this kind of data analytics field. So we're doing a better job building our own data sets. You know, you can learn a lot about someone's life just by seeing what they're spending and when they're spending and how they're spending. And we can share those insights with fintech companies and they're able to help unlock some of the power behind what's happening there. You know, we have a product in our portfolio channel net that does just that. They really look at, you know, creating this one-to-one personalized experience where, you know, the credit union has all this data have all these, you know, members and each member has a different 
experience, but there's some overlap. So, you know, you can customize and you get this dynamic page where, you know, you, you can may see stuff because you've been looking at our website about auto loans. Here's an offer about auto loans, but here's some other relevant information related to the car buying process. You know, so you can get this mix of education, you get this mix of product offering. And then when I go look at, it, I've been looking at, you know, planning for a vacation. So maybe I'm getting stuff about, you know, a credit card that doesn't have international, you know, fees or something like that, depending what, what, what's been happening. Um, FinTechs are doing a really great job of looking at all that transactional data uh, and leveraging that moving forward to, to either unlock that information and give power to the, the, the member or to the institution to then, you know, indirectly help the member as well as we're, you know, crafting the experience for them. Can you share specific examples of how Rosita Group and its portfolio of partners is using technology to enhance member engagement and satisfaction? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I kind of talked about, you know, in the answer to the last question, how there, there's kind of two sides of it. You know, there's how do you unlock it for the consumer and how do you unlock it for the institution? So one great example for how you unlock it for the institution is a company called Nichols. They started really focusing on how do you help educate consumers on how to pay down credit card debt. And as they're exploring that, they were, you know, exploring, you know, and analyzing, you know, the, the transactional data that we had at MSFCU for our members and were able to understand where money was flowing to third party uh, credit cards um, and, and uh, where the money was flowing in and out of their account. And really, we were then able to make an offer uh, to members to refinance that debt at our credit card uh, on one of our credit cards or offer them a debt consolidation loan, a personal loan um, at a lower interest rate. And, and we brought over, you know, for the institution about uh, 20, a little shy of 25 million in about three email campaigns, just based on that highly targeted data set. So that was really uh, an example of how it was unlocked for us as the financial institution. So that's one of Reseda Group's portfolio companies. And then on the member side, we have a few co- uh, companies that are, that are kind of really based on unlocking that that data for for the member themselves and how to understand how that money is flowing in and out of their account. A lot of it is related to you know cash flow and education, and how do you then translate you know educational experience I- into something else? We have one company, Flow Networks. That is really, you know, ultimately a member engagement tool at its core. But what they're doing is focusing on, you know, helping us as an institution own the payment moment. When people are using our cards to make payments or interacting with us during the payment time, they're thinking about us at that time. So how do you actively engage with them a little bit longer than that, you know, two seconds it took to swipe the card? So so what they do is offer an opportunity to, you know, look at the look at how they're spending, what are they doing? And, and this maybe is more of a combo in a way, too. But as they swipe that card, you know, they have different playbooks. One of them is a merchant offers. So let's say you're shopping at, you know, you went to go get food at, let's say, like a Culver's. You use your MSUFCU card, you know, as you use it, you're able to get this immediate offer. And it's immediate. It shows up immediately because that's when we we're thinking you're going to think about it. For the next time you come back to Culver's, use your card, and you get 10% off your order. And that's really a way to create this behavioral behavioral existence between, you know, understanding of the behavior, behavioral economics, if you will, or behavioral use of the, the member and really lay into that to get them to come back and create a pattern of use and not just use the card once and forget about it, but really come back and use it again. So again, help the institution there. They've also looked at the data for our card portfolio and identified low transaction boosters, and they've kind of gamified the experience for helping them, you know, use more, use our card more at MSFCU and, and really you know, helping all credit unions there. So, you know, a lot of people are familiar with the punch card concept. You go buy, you know, way back when, when you got your Subway sandwiches, you got enough punches, and then all of a sudden you got a free sub. Similar concept, you know, but it's digital. So every time you use the transaction, you know, and we're trying to get people from using our card once a year to using it, you know, multiple times a month. So if you use your card five times and you can see, you get a punch each time the card moves, each time you use the card. And that kind of reinforced that they use it because a lot of us offer this as credit unions. But, you know, the member just kind of is like, oh, maybe I did five, maybe I didn't. And all of a sudden you get a statement credit or something. Here it's really obvious. You can see the progress towards it. And then it encourages you to keep going. And, and we've some, seen some really great results from those that did actually get the punches. You know, we offered them a small incentive to do it when we were testing it out of either 3 or $5. It didn't actually matter the amount there. People were just excited to get value for the reward. Um, and from that, you know, they then uh, moved forward uh, and continued to use the card and became habitual. So they were pulling out their card more frequently you know, a- even after, you know, we kind of ended the promotion. So, you know, that, that was good uh, way to, to highlight that. And maybe one more, one more example, you know, we have a lot of, a lot of portfolio companies that could go on all day, but, you know, we'll just give one more quick example. Prize out is a, an interesting one. So many people are familiar with Groupon. A lot of people are familiar with the gift card. It's kind of a combo of those two, 
And a gift card may or may not be the right right name for it because a lot of people, you know, your times you're buying this for yourself. So it's like a self gift card in, in some case. But prize out what they do is work with merchants, and it's really a merchant funded offer, if you will, to, you know, let's say you're gonna go buy stuff at a home improvement store later today. Well, I may go look in the prize out, you know, thing built into digital banking through single sign on. And we see Home Depot is offering a $120 gift card at a cost of $100 to me as the the member. Well, okay, great. And then I also see that Lowe's is offering 135 bucks. Well, maybe I'm going to go buy whatever I was going to buy now at Lowe's because I can get 35 extra dollars towards that. So that, that's kind of a great opportunity. And you can go shop and look for what you're doing based on what you're going to do. But PrizeOut also looks and sees based on kind of your activities with the credit union and the char- the data and the kind of the other data they have access to in the consumer world what maybe the best offer for me is maybe they know already like i like to go to the home improvement store so here's a home improvement offer or maybe you know they can tell i like to you know i go to a certain uh, restaurant and they know maybe it's about the time i would usually go to that restaurant so then here you go here's an offer for that restaurant to get a little bit more bang for my buck uh, when i go that punch card idea is such a great idea because i always forget i have a punch card whenever exactly right the place yeah. offers it so Exactly. It's great that that they can digitally track that because I always forget yep. them or I lose them. To help me wrap my head around that, so how do you members get a notification that there is an offer? Do they buy something? Let's say, you, we, let's go back to the, the Home sure. Depot thing. They buy something from Home Depot and then do they get a notification on their phone? They get an email? How, how do they yep. get the information? Yeah, so... You, so- the kind of the great thing about the the Reseda Group is is we're working as a portfolio of companies and encouraging these companies that you know started as separate entities to really work and collaborate with each other. So you know we have a, a company in the portfolio Larky that is focused on doing push notifications and geofencing. You know that helps complement something like a push. You know, they provide the push notifications. So you know you go you you make your transaction, you push, you know get a push notification. You know then from that push notification you can come into the MSCFCU mobile app see whatever, you know, you could see that punch card, you know, from flow in the MSUFCU mobile app, you know, some things that we're trying to do, you know, and to help tie this together further is then you could then offer, you know, a prize out gift card for another trip to Home Depot as well, you know, as, as mm-hmm. part of that. And the credit union could then choose to fund that as part of a rewards program, or, you know, it could come from the merchant or just could simply be, you know, highlighting what's already available to people and just bringing their attention to it. But really that push notification we have found has been the most effective way to drive people in. And maybe one comment to make, you know, a lot of stuff goes through email nowadays. And we're probably to the point now, and I made this comment a couple of times in some conversations as I've been at different events in the, in the past few weeks, where email has become like, you know, kind of like the old mailbox where they've got all this junk mail in there and the junk mail doesn't even make it into the house. Like you throw it in the, the garbage bin or the, hopefully the recycle bin uh, on your way in and you just don't even look at it. There's so many emails that are coming through every day from all these merchants we're just ignoring them, you know, and we're, you know, I know that, you know, I have, you know, get 200 emails in my Gmail in a day. You know, I look at three of them because I know they're from three things I care about and the rest of them, I don't even bother to look at or delete or anything. I just move on, you know, so push notification, something that right now at least is front and center. It also kind of mitigates some of the the text message issues that you have as well, where there's been a lot of you know, smishing, phishing type stuff happening through that. Push notification at least lets you know it's coming from the app it's coming from. So it then has the reference and then links you back into MSFC mobile. So you know you're authenticating there. It's not just some random text link that you're going to click and who knows where you end up. If you don't end up in the MSU mobile app, don't enter any more information. You know, it is really the the clue there. So, you know, there's some fraud mitigation there. There's also a lot of ability to personalize and tap into the actual like location of the user and then really remind people also. So you, you know, oh, you forgot your punch card. Hey, remember, you're here again. You had this offer that you selected. You have this, you know, prize out gift card. Hey, remember to use it while you're here. So, interesting. And one more follow up question on that: Do you members have to buy something for them to get an offer, or can they preemptively look for offers on the app? Yep. So they can preemptively look. You know, it's, so if you come log in, absolutely. You know, we're, we're going to pop one and say, hey, here's the the best offer we think for you. There is some some interesting maybe thought there too. You know, a lot of people when they're coming to do interaction with their finance, if you interrupt them, you know, which might be a great opportunity for the thing you're trying to offer to them, think it would be. But if you interrupt their experience, they again want to dismiss it, do whatever they came in to do, and then they're willing to accept it. So in that kind of transaction, you want to offer them the opportunity to engage with something, but you want to maybe do it after they had a chance to come in and check their balance or move that money around and then offer it to them. 
But yeah, and then they also have the ability to go in and, and kind of discover. But you know, I think again, there's so much stuff sometimes that we are bombarded with that you're not necessarily going to go seek something out. If you have something specific in mind, probably easy to find, you know, through an easy search. But if you're just kind of browsing, it's there. But we're trying to again use the data to offer what's most relevant to you. And data's become rich enough, and these companies, you know, have done such a great job focusing on you know, understanding both consumer behavior and how to how to identify things in the data sets that it really helps become a really powerful engine to have these partnerships to to really take the data we already have and unlock it and really make it to the benefit of our members. And, and really a lot of these things are truly meant to be a way to engage in digital beyond just checking your balance and moving money around or paying a bill. Great. In what ways has technology allowed Rosita Group to stay adaptable and relevant in the rapidly changing financial services industry? Absolutely. So, you know, I, I think one of the biggest things is is by forming these partnerships, by encouraging these companies to work together. And now with Rosita adding some of our own products into the mix to kind of kind of bridge the gap. And, and some of the technology we're trying to build specifically for, you know, the credit union industry are some of the connectors that help make it easy for credit unions to work with these companies and for these companies to work with credit unions. This is work we've had to do to, to get things put into MSUX. And we're trying to not to, you know, we're trying to help again, amplify the entire credit union industry by creating, you know, some of these connectors and, and what we're calling the Reseda hub, which is, you know, the our, our suite of APIs that we're working on bringing to market here, hopefully soon, to, to really allow these companies to be able to work together more easily with credit unions. So, you know, it's not a 12 month project or a, a 12 week project, even hopefully to, to onboard and, and start testing some of these solutions. And that way you can get more, more value in, into the hands of your consumers as quickly as possible. So I think there's a lot of uh, power in, in what's happened with kind of the revolution of development where everything is in APIs and SDKs, where, you know, all these companies can more easily work together and you don't have to be, you know, every company doesn't have to build everything, you know, be good at one thing you know, and then leverage the, the things that you may be only okay at or can only be okay at. And that way you end up with a stellar experience overall. And, and as, as credit unions can take advantage of the work that's being done here and the work Reseda Group is doing to pull these companies together and kind of curate an experience. And really we're trying to curate that around, you know, kind of a life stage experience. So, you know, we have people who are, you know, young members, youth members. We have people who are graduating college. We have people who are nearing retirement. And we're trying to find solutions that do that. You may be a homeowner. You may be someone uh, who's still renting. And, and life stage doesn't necessarily mean we want to target Gen Z, Gen Alpha, you know, baby boomers, Gen X. You know, We don't want to be in those kind of broad demographic categories. While that's helpful, we really want to meet people where they're at in their financial journey. Because you can be you know, 30 just starting college and moving out of your parents' house, or you could be doing that at 19. And those people may have similar experiences versus someone who, you know, graduated at 24, has a family, is buying a house at 30. So, and there's nothing, no judgment on any of that. We just need to be there for our members. And these technology solutions help with that personalization that allows for us to be able to offer that more strongly than we could alone. So let's shift over a little bit to data analytics and AI. Uh, how can a company use tools such as these to anticipate member demands and proactively offer personalized solutions? Yeah, absolutely. AI is kind of the biggest buzzword going. A lot of it is related to chat GPT now, but AI has kind of been in the background uh, of a lot of you know revolutions in computers, computer science and how we interact with them and how the member experience really has been able to be personalized in recent years. A lot of that has to do with, again, how we've organized all the data, how it's no longer in 4,000 systems. We're starting to do work with different companies bringing in data lakes and bringing in the right people to help organize that data. Some of where the power becomes is when you hit scale, right? So right now, you know, a lot of credit unions have a lot of their own data, but we only have 300,000 members. If you compare us to a Chase who has, I don't know, millions of customers, I don't know the actual number, but they're going to have a richer data set from their own, you know, data from their customers than we as one single credit union have. So leveraging these fintechs that if we're able to provide them with our data in an anonymized way that they can then build a larger data set to train their models, they're able to determine people who are, you know, people like me will do this thing, you know, and they're able to figure that out based on how I'm spending and the larger data set they can train on, you know, the more they can do. So really trying to help amplify that. We have some things that we're, we're going to be announcing later in the year that really are around, you know, how do we leverage this data? Some stuff we're doing with ChannelNet is also around this and we're going to, you know, ChannelNet is very strong 
in a rules and configuration engine, but could be, you know, you put a little gas on the fire by adding some AI to that to, to really amplify what it's doing. Um, it's solid tech, but it, it's time to really move it to its next level. And AI is going to allow us to do that. And again, all around this personalization of the member experience is really at the core of a lot of what we're doing. And it's either how do you personalize the experience when they interact with the credit union in any of the channels, or is it the member self-serving in a different way? Because we know who they are, we know more about them. And then you're able to start to make some predictions. You know, we as humans use our human intelligence to look at people and, you know, because back in the day we had to decide whether someone was a threat or not immediately, where have this, you know, behavioral thing built into us that we say, hey, you're a threat, you're not a threat. You know, hey, you're a human, you're a robot. I'm going to trust the human because they're a human. Well, how do you trust the AI? How do you trust, you know, a chatbot or, you know, ChatGPT even? You know, so by understanding more about the, the members that we're working with, you know, we're able to offer them things that are highly relevant. And then they don't mind being bombarded with offers because it's not a bombardment. You're actually providing them with real value. And, and you don't want to just throw, you know, you know, spaghetti at the wall and hope something sticks. You really want to be able to target it. And you can also reduce your expenses at, as a credit union. If you're more targeting offers, you know, maybe you're going to mail to 100 people who are most likely to buy a thing and maybe you get a 90% conversion rate because you really looked at the data. If you were to just mail it to all your members, maybe you still get 90 people and then you spent, you know, how many more thousands of dollars on postage alone just to send a mailer? So, Will the member get notifications based on things they're buying frequently? Or, for example, if it was something you bought a lot, like groceries, and you got, you got offers for groceries. But if you like buy something expensive once, and then it's annoying when you get like a ton of emails from that company you bought yep. for something you bought once is Rosita Group kind of doing the the first thing I talked about where the, it, it's kind of based off what they buy frequently? Yeah, so maybe there's a little nuance to that question. So I think we've all experienced when you go like, maybe you had the opportunity to replace an appliance or something. So you're mm -hmm. shopping all of a sudden, you, you went and bought you know a new fridge, 2,000 bucks, never going to buy one hopefully for another 20 years. But then all right. of a sudden that exact same fridge you just bought is now being shown to you in every social media ad for the next like month. Why? I'm not right, buying a yeah. second one. Or sometimes <laughs> even when you buy something for the holidays, you know, then you get all these ads. Well, I didn't buy that for myself. Yeah. So I think, you know, absolutely we're we're trying to focus on what are you buying more frequently. But I think you can also look at people who buy groceries at these places, you know, in this pattern may also be doing, you know, maybe it's always around grill season. Maybe there is an opportunity to slip in an offer for a grill or something. Maybe we, you know, it'd be really great if we get down to what are you actually buying at the grocery store? You know, but that, that I don't know if we're there yet, but, you know, just by seeing you're frequently going to a grocery store, maybe it's, you know, maybe here's a better example. You know, perhaps you booked a hotel and you may get this from an airline or, you know, a, a travel company. You booked a hotel and you booked a, a plane ticket. Well, maybe you need a rental car. You know, maybe it's an opportunity to, to offer a rental car option if somehow you had a deal for that. Or maybe you booked those three and maybe you need gas for the rental car. So here's now an offer for gas or something. You know, there, there's some things I think you could you could do. Beyond just, I buy groceries, so I'm going to offer for groceries. I think there's some, you know, and this is for the smart data scientists to figure out where the linkages are. Uh, but there is opportunity to then do like, you know, if you like this, you may also like this. And if you don't, allow the consumer to give feedback and say, yeah, that's not me. And then when you guess strong, at least the consumer is telling you, you guess strong, and then you can further refine the model. And that's not too dissimilar for anyone who's familiar with Netflix. You know, that's the model they use, mm -hmm. you know. Here's what they have. This is what they know about you based on your behavior. Then they ask you some questions along the way. They ask you to rate things. They ask you to do things. And then you give it a thumbs down and say, nope, never show me anything like this again. And they take that to heart. And then they refine what they think about you and then present you better options. So, you know, I think there's a lot of companies that do that as well. Like Stitch Fix is a great example of kind of consumer behavior. They're like, oh, what do you like to do on a Friday night? What do you, you know, uh, if you were going to go to plan a vacation, where would it be? And all of a sudden it says, these are the perfect, you know, set of clothes for you. And then based on what you pick over time and what you send back and keep, they further refine it. But, you know, they, they have these kind of fun, engaging ways to find out more about you. Uh, and then from that, you know, they're able to do product recommendations in the background using the data they have, plus the data you give them. And that's when it really becomes powerful. If the, the members are willing to engage, and provide additional layers on top of what we already know and what the fintechs can bring to the table, then it becomes a super powerful uh, cycle to really, truly hyper-personalize the experience overall.
What strategies should be employed to balance the adoption of cutting edge technologies while maintaining a seamless and user friendly customer experience? Yeah, absolutely. So I think one thing we found, you know, over time, you know, you can have too many apps, you know, and if everything's a different app, how do they work together seamlessly? And that does become a challenge. If you have to go to 30 different experiences to have 30 different experiences, what's the point? And that's one of the great things about what's trying, what we're trying to help accomplish in the credit union industry is to create companies that are working together collaboratively. Some of the work we're doing at Reseda, such as the Reseda Hub, is to try to bring these technologies together in a way where there's one path in, or there's integrations, or there's platform integrations where everything can be combined in the digital banking channel. It could be combined in you know a, 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 a digital platform of some kind. There can be things that are more in the background to help facilitate things. So you may have you know 30 relationships, but to the member, it feels like it's a relationship with just your credit union. And that's that's key. So it's okay if they know it's this other company. It doesn't always have to be something where you say, this is X fintech, you're doing this. There are some that people are going to want to do because that brand recognition is there. There are other where the brand recognition doesn't matter. It's just they're facilitating something for you know the the company. You know, the 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 Jeep I drive has, I think it's an Android tablet for the screen. I don't know it's an Android tablet, it's just a great screen and it does everything in my Jeep. You know, that's an integration that's seamless. You know, I wouldn't have bought an i. I probably would have bought an iPad to put it in there if I was asked to go buy something because I have Apple stuff, not because of any other reason. So that integration didn't matter. The screen works, the software works, it drives the car, it does you know all the fun hands-free things and all that that needs to happen now. So we're trying to do the same thing to to have that seamless experience, pulling all those pieces together. And probably cars are a good example of that, and other large you know vehicles, other things where. All these companies come together to create all these components that are then assembled by one company who the consumer ultimately buys from. We're trying to do that same thing at Reseda. We're really trying to be kind of that manufacturer to create these experiences that are seamless, you know, and, and leverage our knowledge, you know, in partnership with these companies and also our experience, you know, being part of MSUFCU to really, really make that seamless and give it a try first before, you know, sending it out to the market as well. So earlier you mentioned Rosita Group has a portfolio of partners it's connected to. Uh, how do you leverage their expertise to enhance the solutions you are bringing to the credit union industry? Absolutely. So we work with them in a number of different ways. So one of the, the first and foremost, we have a, a great partnership with MSU, FCU, and, and we don't put anything into Rosita Group as a portfolio company that isn't also partnered with MSU, FCU and something that MSU, FCU believes in and is actually putting to market with their their uh, members. So there's an innovation lab, the lab at MSUFCU, a lot of the pilot partners, or a lot of the partners who are in Reseda started as pilot partners in the lab, had some success. Again, MSUFCU believed in them, brought them over to Reseda as they're looking to scale to help really amplify that credit union industry tie that they all set out to have and, and really help move them along. We also help try to navigate some of those connections and, and try to start some of that system thinking and start to identify who in the portfolio could work with each other. But we also look at perhaps who's missing from the portfolio. You know, you know, at the beginning of the year, we didn't have anyone in the, the business lending or business banking. And that's something that a lot of people are trying to think at. So we're trying to think about what's there. We brought in a company, Ascent, who's, who's starting to get into that space and looking at a couple others as well. Um, but we're trying to find, you know, what are credit unions doing? What is the industry looking for? What are we trying to find at MSFCU? And then, then finding partners to do that with us. Sometimes we know it's it's going to be a hit, you know, based on the success they've had other other places. And we may start them with an investment and then put them over to the, the lab. We've also done it in a way where we may start an earlier stage company. We'll give them a small seed funding and then put them to the lab. And as that relationship grows, then they get follow on rounds that are, you know, increasing larger and larger. Again, you know, no, not too different, you know, as they had different rounds, you know, this is not too similar to other VCs invest as well, but we're trying to be a strategic partner to really, you know, be a partner and really help amplify in, in the market. And then we also have a lot of different initiatives within the portfolio itself to bring the founders together, to bring the tech people together, to bring the marketing people together and really discuss problems as a portfolio. You know, currently that represents itself as, you know, we have a, a quarterly call for all the companies to send, you know, whoever they want to send. And, and we talk about different topics. You know, some of it is, you know, if you're going to work with credit unions, you know, what due diligence is needed? You know, what is a CEO looking at when they are looking for these solutions? You know, what compliance things do you need to know as a fintech to really be able to sell to a credit union and different things? 
Also, they get into some of the, how do their tech work? They're all selling to credit unions, what works, what doesn't work. So really trying to encourage them to also, and mentor them for how to work with credit unions as well for the experience we have, you know, again, being affiliated and, you know, owned wholly by MSUFCU. And how do you identify emerging trends and consumer behaviors to make informed decisions on adapting service offerings, creating products, and evaluating portfolio partners? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a number of different ways. A lot, a lot of reading, uh, and not books, but you know, you know, what's the the tech headlines? Fast Company is a good resource for that. Social media. What are, what are the trends happening? What's happening in banking? You know, we go to a number of different industry events. One event that I went to last year for the first time was CES, Consumer Electronics Show. You know, usually you hear about all the video games and other things that are launched there over over the years. But it's a cool way to get and see what other industries are doing because I think we can learn a lot from other industries and see where that's coming. So when I went there in January last year, a lot of the focus was on, you know, vehicle tech. So the, all these cars, you know, a lot of it starting with Tesla, but all the cars have screens and all these infotainment systems you know, and all this voice activated stuff in there, what can you do with it? Are consumers going to be banking, you know, in their car or what embedded finance needs will exist, you know, so let's get to it now while everyone's trying to build all the, the infrastructure for it, then we can be there at the beginning. Other things I saw there were around automation of all kinds that could be robotics. That could also be, you know, the process automation in the background to really make all of our companies more efficient. Right, so those are two big, big highlights. We also go to uh, a lot of industry things, both credit union, non-credit union, some of the bigger events for the year, Money 2020, the Finnovates, just to really see what's new. Uh, I think it's also important to look at other markets. There's a lot that happens in, you know, the financial sector where you know the Asian market really gets things first and figures it out, and and it just seems to start there, and then you know think things like AliPay and WeChat. And then things will move over to Europe. And a lot of things there also have, you know, some different government regulations as well that drive different thought processes and how members, you know, members, customers, consumers own their data versus, the, you know, the bank owning the data. So that's what led to GDPR, right? So who actually owns the data was challenged in Europe. And a lot of these companies, especially the neobanks, grew up in Europe because of that. So, you know, there's different things in the different markets. And what can we take from that, you know, and maybe not wait 15 years to get something similar here, but really just take the best of it all and create that really great experience. And looking ahead, how do you envision the role of technology playing in the ongoing evolution of fintechs and their ability to cater to future customer needs? Absolutely. So I, I think you know, there, there's kind of two point, points to this. You know, The technology is always going to advance. And sometimes the technology advances so quickly that we don't know what to do with it. And we've seen that a few times where, you know, in, in recent history, so, you know, dot-com boom, you know, end of the 90s, web was the thing. Everything was just, oh, I'll make a website and it'll do something. Some of them were crap, some of them were good. And then, you know, now the web is like the place we do everything, right? You know, so we do everything online and online is finally the right word anymore because there's no lines involved anymore. But, you know, we're doing everything in a digital fashion. You know, we did the same thing with mobile. Everyone wanted to have a mobile app. Let's do it. When the, the app, when they started putting apps from third parties in the app store, they were silly. They were, oh, I have a flashlight app, but it just turns the screen white, and you know, and you can have a little extra glow. Or it's a mirror app, and it turns the screen black, and you're actually just using the glass of the phone to look at yourself. Now you have a front-facing camera. But what you know, Apple and the other Android did in those moments, or what were people trying to create? And then they they used consumer behavior to enhance those products to what it was. But it took the the software industry you know, 10 plus years to create something now that you can run off your phone that you couldn't run off a computer even three years ago. You know, these phones have become like ubiquitous to everything we do, but it took all this business acumen to really figure out how to leverage it and take it to that point. But the technology had to be the enabler. They built these phones with all these great sensors, you know, and now the phones are incrementally changing because a lot of the work is going into the software side of it. It doesn't have to have you know, sure, it gets a better camera every time. It doesn't need to have like 57 new sensors developed because now we, we haven't even taken advantage of what's there yet. So, you know, we're doing the same thing with AI. And, you know, more recently, ChatGPT is getting all the credit, you know, but, you know, again, ChatGPT is kind of the interface for that open AI, generative AI, large language model in the background. That is super powerful tech, but people are going to have to figure out what to do with it. And business leaders are just now getting their heads around what can it do? and how to evaluate it and where are the risks for my business. And once that all gets figured out and it starts getting applied to things and people can start to, to leverage it even further, 
that's when it's really going to start happening. And these cycles get shorter and shorter, but it still is kind of this balance between, you know, the tech gets there, but is the business ready for it? And if it's not, how do we make those cycles quicker? Thanks for listening to the CUNA News Podcast. Subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. This podcast is sponsored by Rosita Group, a wholly owned QSO of Michigan State University Federal Credit Union, with a mission to help credit unions stay relevant and competitive through innovation. Rosita Group invests in technologies and services that improve how credit unions engage with the members and help members engage with their money. Rosita Group, building better for members together with our partners.